I'm Phil Rickaby, and I am the host of the Canadian theatre podcast, Stageworthy. Stageworthy is a weekly podcast featuring intimate and knowledgeable conversations about art and theatre in Canada. Each week, I talk to a theatre creator about creativity, their inspirations, what drew them to the theatre, and so much more. It's like chatting with your very knowledgeable theatre friends about the state of theatre in Canada. Find it at stageworthypodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Wow, that never did that. But anyway, okay. Um, you know, it's a new feature. It's a new we feature. Just, we just discovered I it on our show too. Hate mm. it. Anyway, <laughs> hello everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and with me, as always, is the hostess with the mostess, Mackenzie. Yo, How are you? I'm good. You? Pretty all right. It's, anyway. hard, to, it's hard. It's hard to be anything else these days. <laughs> Exactly. Joining us today, we actually have two very special guests from a wonderful podcast that also covers Canadian politics, pop culture, pretty much anything under the sun that's related to this fascinatingly weird country of ours. We have Katie and Olivia from the Just Watch Me podcast. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. I really not. liked your introduction. Sorry, I really liked your introduction to our podcast. That was a very apt description of it. Well, how else would you describe it, honestly? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do you have like an idea, a through line for your podcast when you uh, when you talk about it to people? Like, how do you present it? Yeah, it's kind of an ongoing conversation, but I think okay. that we want to reconsider what you thought you knew about Canada, mm -hmm. and so in maybe unexpected ways. Maybe you didn't know that Pamela Anderson was Canadian and maybe you didn't know that much about her. So, you know, it's like you said, we, ta we tackle everything, but that's, I think, kind of like the heart of how we pick our episodes, if you will. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, we, we kind of look for things that are either uh, under-examined or over-examined, but in the wrong ways. Like I think Pamela Anderson is is both over-examined and under-examined in that sense and mm -hmm. that um, you don't really hear about like the tragedies in her life and like all the sexism that she went through um, you know like that kind of thing is something that we're really interested in and we're naturally interested in stories that affect women's lives um, with the through line always being being Canada being culture um, sometimes that means like recent Canadian history uh, that's like just a love of ours. We're both lawyers. So anything that has a bit of a legal angle is something that we can, you know, more easily riff on. So we'll gravitate towards that. Although we have a rule that we are not a law podcast, um, but, but that necessarily finds its way in. Yeah, that, that's kind of, but it's interesting that you bring that up because that's kind of related, obviously, to our topic of the show today. It's why I reached out to you in the first place. I was planning on reaching out to you regardless because I love your show. I find it's great. But the... The whole impetus behind the show is very much steeped in law and legality and that whole system, right? So today, for those of you who somehow did not read the episode title before clicking on it, we're going to be talking about Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace, right? Which is based on a real life uh, case uh, of a Irish immigrant named Grace Marks, who was accused of murdering her employer. We'll get into that a bit later, but that was a bit of the impetus why Katie and Olivia were invited onto the show. Um, I don't and also know, we however, felt it was about time to have women on the show when talking about women writers and authors and so on. Yeah, just, you know, representation wise, it, it was a better look. <laughs> But actually, I'm curious because law is this massive uh, subject that you can go on for literally an entire career about. What exactly uh, do you, you two, what part of the law do you study? Or Lives more oh, interesting. No, <laughs> I'm not. We're, we're, we're actually both like just new lawyers. So it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. As of like, like, this, like weeks yeah, old recently. lawyers. Yeah. Wow. Truly infant lawyers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We've, we've upgraded from like baby lawyers to toddlers mm -hmm, at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm an entertainment lawyer. I do primarily film and TV, but um, listen, if you have any podcasting needs, knock on my door because okay. I'm available. <laughs> He's breaking into new media. Awesome. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Uh, I'm a civil litigator. Uh, so I do, we do uh, lots of different kinds of, of civil disputes, but um yeah, not quite as interesting as <laughs> movies and TV, but a pretty a pretty broad practice of issues. Yeah. So if you need help, 
Let me know. Okay. <laughs> I, I if you don't get have sued, any... call Katie. Exactly. If you've got a contract that needs reviewing, you call me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair exactly. Enough. Well, duly noted. It, I'm, I'm sorry, Katie, but I, I'll have to disagree with you on that. Um, my partner's mother is a lawyer in exactly that civil, uh, in civil law and is interested in that aspect. And I've had some wonderful conversations with her. So honestly, I, don't sell yourself short on that one. Just because you don't get to cover people like Pamela Anderson through your, through your law practice doesn't mean that it's not interesting. Oh, it's definitely it's definitely interesting. It's maybe not quite as glamorous all the time, but uh, but it's it's, uh, it's a great area. Yeah, entertainment lawyer is not as glamorous as it sounds in the title. <laughs> oh no, it's not like in the movies. No, no, it's I, I love it. I literally adore it. I can't say anything bad about it. I spend half of my days watching movies. It's it's a good gig, but oh, um, wow. it's not as it's not anyway. I'm anyway. I'm just gonna stop talking. I really love my job. I don't need to sell it any further. <laughs> So, I love my job, please. Today on the uh, Historia Canadiana, we're just going to listen to Katie and Liv talk about their jobs. That's actually a backdoor uh, pilot for just Katie <laughs> and Liv promotion. explain it all. Yeah, exactly. Margaret Atwood was clickbait. Now yep. you're here for the law talk. <laughs> Imagine. What a disappointment. <laughs> I mean, honestly, at this point, the way we run the show, I wouldn't put it past us to just pull a move like that <laughs> just for the fun of it. But um, anyway, we can get right into the topic. Did any of you have any idea of what this, either this book was or the event that it was based on before going into it, right? Is this something that you were aware of or maybe through the TV show that recently dropped? You know, really, we're striking when the iron is hot on the popularity of that TV show that's like two years old at this point. But <laughs> no, I, I think I heard the name Alien Grace and that's about it. I haven't lived Did you just here. say alien grace? You know, maybe. I might have said it accidentally. <laughs> That's how little I know. I think it's all about UFOs and other such things. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I actually, I actually did watch uh, the Netflix show. I'm, I was a huge fan of it. I thought it was really, really well done. Right. Um, Canadian content on its finest. Yeah, absolutely. It aired on the CBC first, or was it a Netflix original? ABC. Thing. Yeah, my understanding was it was CBC and then uh, Netflix picked it up. Okay, right. I tried to get into the show, but I couldn't finish it in time for this uh, for this episode. But it looked really great, uh, as mm -hmm. you were saying, Olivia. It's it looks fantastic uh, from like the episode and a half that I watched. I really want yeah, to get I into. Started it. watching it. It was like it was pretty fascinating, honestly. Yeah, um, and Katie, on your end. No, I I also saw the show and I thought it was Elias Grace, even though I do know how to read um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, originally. And then I, I dipped into the story. I didn't read it yet, but I mm -hmm. was researching around it when we did our Margaret Atwood episode um, on Shame our podcast. Plus. Sorry, I had yeah. to say it. Um, Go ahead. So that's why, uh, that's that's the only reason I knew a little bit about the story. I knew it was a, a true crime story. Well, I won't spoil it, but, but no, I was kind of coming in pretty fresh. <laughs> I guess the the best way because this the essentially alias grace is what we call historical fiction right so a lot of this episode where our usual episodes cover first the history and then the book we're less going to do that this time because the novel is historical fiction we can basically touch on the history elements as we go through the book and as we discuss it right um, but just to provide a bit of context, right, the real Grace Marx was an Irish immigrant who came to Upper Canada in 1840, so just, because, just before it became um, Canada West. So she actually worked as a maid in a few places before she was sent to the upper class home of a certain Thomas Kinnear in 1843. And this is pretty much where things get contentious, right? Where the beginning of her life was pretty average for most Irish immigrants coming in, doing odd jobs here and there, basically making a living where they could. The Kinnear household would pretty much be turned on his head when Kinnear himself and his housekeeper, Nancy Montgomery, would be murdered um, about three weeks after Grace Marks arrived. So to quote actually from Margaret Atwood, she, she actually has a whole talk that she did in 1998 about the real Grace Marks and her writing of the book. 
So to quote Margaret Atwood, both of them, Kinnear and Montgomery, ended up dead in the cellar and Grace Marks and James McDermott made it across Lake Ontario to the United States with a wagon full of stolen goods. They were caught and brought back and tried for the murder of Thomas Kinnear. The murder of Nancy Montgomery was never tried as both were convicted and condemned to death. James McDermott was hanged and Grace Marks was sentenced as an accessory, but as a result of petitions by her well-wishers and in consideration of her feebler sex, still quoting Margaret Atwood here, um, and extreme youth, she was barely 16. Her sentence was commuted to life. Now, there's a lot more that we can unpack from this, of course, but that at least gives us a general outline of what Atwood was working with and where the novel and the story of the TV show starts, right? because it basically follows Grace Marks in prison, right? trying just before she's put on trial and just after. Right? It happens in that kind of weird period just well, before her trial and after. Yeah. Isn't that part of the design of the show, though, is that it's about, like, because you're going back and forth and back and forth because they use the doctor narrative. That's what Margaret Atwood did. She invented this doctor character to then take down Mark's Grace story to sort of give it, lend it a sort of quality, I guess, I'd, unreliable narrator, so that she, it gave her more room to play around with the story. Yeah. A bit more liberty from the history. Absolutely. Right. That kind of gets into... I guess we can kind of get right into the writing of the book, right? And just the I, the whole concept of it in general. So you're absolutely right. Part of what makes this novel special is that it's what's called historiographic metafiction, right? Which is more of a literary term than anything else. Um, and it basically means that we're playing with the idea of history through fiction. So kind of poking holes or filling in blanks and questioning the official narratives of history through literature. Uh, Alias Grace is a really well-known example, but you can see all kinds of them throughout uh, Canadian history. The, the history of Canadian literature is filled with them. Just to kind of open it up the discussion to the book in general, what did, so what did any of you think of the story, right? Do you think it was interesting? Did you not really care? Was it something that uh, changed your opinions about anything at all, about Margaret Atwood herself uh, as a writer? What were your kind of general initial thoughts about it? I really liked the device of, um, that Mackenzie brought up, the device of uh, Dr. Simon Jordan um, and having Grace Marks tell her story as a probably unreliable narrator. Um, and I really enjoyed that format because it was like, it was like someone was telling me a story that was telling me a story. <laughs> and I found that, like, I really liked that format. Um, I also love the format of having, um, like reading primary documents at the beginning of, I think each chapter or each part. Um, so for those who haven't read it, this isn't a spoiler, but it, each chapter, and I listen to it as, as I've said many times, I don't read. So, uh, I have to listen, um, because I don't have any attention span left, but it, it's really, it's really cool to hear because you don't know what's coming because you kind of forget to hear it, it like a completely different version, um, of gr someone else's take on Grace Marks in trial or someone else's explanation or journalists, a journalist's, uh, article on Grace Marks and then have the chapter start with her telling her her story to Dr. Simon Jordan. I thought that was really interesting. I enjoyed that, the way that she set that up. I was also going to say, I think that we kind of forget how revolutionary Margaret Atwood was too for her time. I think like a story like this that has a woman at the center where this, you know, psychiatrist is literally sitting and listening to a woman speak is, is in and itself quite a revolutionary concept um, at the time. And yeah, we're, we're big Margaret Atwood fans at the pod. So um, yeah, I think, I think that her contribution to like Canadian literature generally um, deserves kind of a shout out there too. Interesting. So we might have a discussion about our fandom of Margaret Atwood a bit later, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the um, it, it's interesting that you bring up right the kind of refocusing that she does on history. This idea that well, okay, well, generally speaking, when we think of history, the assumptions, even though they've kind of been broken down over time, the assumptions that we still have about so many historical narratives is this idea of a great man theory, right? For obviously, I did air quotes with my fingers, which always plays well on an audio format, but the 
uh, the idea that that history is led by these central male figures, right? And that's definitely something that Atwood is good at, is kind of shifting her gaze back onto the forgotten aspects of history, or at least the erased ones. So she did it most importantly, or most notably, I think, before Alias Grace, she did it with Susanna Moody um, in 1970, so a good almost 30 years before the publication of Alias Grace. So she published a collection of poetry named the Journals of Susanna Moody, which was uh, similar uh, in its idea of kind of re-examining this so-called seminal figure in Canadian letters and Canadian politics and history. But what I find really interesting, right, is trying to think about why this voice is important in particular, right? Why Grace Marks? Right. Why Susanna Moody, I can kind of get it right when she did it. It's this representation of uh, this colonial figure who came over. It kind of represents the hardships that many people lived through when they came to Canada, especially in the winter. It's something that you can kind of all relate to. And it made sense, especially in the context in which she was writing it. In the 1970s, there was this big nationalist movement in Canada and she wanted to reinscribe a lot of this uh, these new ideas, right? Or these ideas that had been perceived as lost. I'm curious why this voice would be particularly important to revive, or at least revive in the way that she did. To me, I think part of what she's doing, she's breaking down down that trope of the hysterical woman. You know, there's this, this ingrained thought that women will, for some reason, they act crazy or they go into like their mood swings or so on and so forth. And I think she's breaking down. That's it because you watch, I watched one of the episodes and I read sort of bits and pieces online where I could find them. And she, uh, alias Grace Marks, Grace, Grace Marks, Grace Marks herself is very, she speaks very well. You know, she's, she has a good voice, but then everybody's treating her like she's crazy. And that's the important backdrop is, you know, this the debate of the asylum and her voice, the unreliable narrative that's going on. I think Atwood's really trying to break down this idea that Oh, those crazy women, what are they going to get up to next? And instead trying to show that that's false, really. Or that it can at least be looked at in a different light, right? Because, mm -hmm. I don't know, it depends how you look at madness, but it's certainly not limited to women. <laughs> I was yeah. like, we'll, we'll make that very clear oh, here sure. and now. <laughs> like, well, it's, it's funny that you ask, you know, like, why, why her? Because... We talk. We talked a little bit about actually Grace Marks in our episode about um, Carla Homoka because it's like, you know, <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I have the answer to your question on why her, but I think that we all have a fascination regarding evil women, um, and I think that this book especially does a really good job diving into also like the audience fascination with that and i think that margaret atwood in some ways does turn the camera the camera's the wrong expression but does kind of like shine a light on the audience at the end and kind of in the way that she ends the book in a, in a sort of unsatisfying way because she doesn't give us the answer she doesn't tell us if she did it or didn't do it and I think personally that she's trying to spotlight uh, the reader and say like, what, what do you want here? Like, why do you care so much about this woman? And why are you so fascinated with her? So uh, I think that you're, I, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to kind of change the course of the conversation, but um, that, that's what I think she's up to. No, honestly, like we said at the beginning, the conversation can go in any way. Like I have a series of questions and all that, but it really doesn't matter. The The point is that the, the conversation goes it's into flowing. new and interesting directions. Absolutely. So take it in any direction you guys want. Absolutely. Well, Olivia, I see Carla Mocha's towards the end of your outline, but Olivia brought her up. So I, I think I can, I can follow that. And I think that uh, I think anytime we, we think about women in crime in Canada, we think about Carla Homoka, but uh, it is like, these are good examples of our understandings of like the binaries with which we look at women and women and women who are violent is like, and Grace Marks talks about this too. It's interesting to hear her, hear her say it about herself. She, she's uh, extremely pretty, but extremely, pra extremely plain. It's like the Madonna horror complex. It's, she's obviously completely manipulated this young man, or she's been completely manipulated by this young man and it's not in between. Um, and it's one or the other and both at the same time. It's that like, 
we have to put women in these binaries and we don't we're not really able to understand uh especially women in violence as nuance and i think the same is true for the way that we talk about carla hamoka like there are so many canadians who think that like she was completely bamboozled at, by paul bernardo and she was like just kind of stupid and completely drawn along by him and there are some who believe that like she is lady Macbeth. She is the reason all this happened. Uh, Paul didn't kill until he met Carla, that whole thing. And there's very few people who fall somewhere in the middle or who can hold all those ideas at the same time. We're not really capable of it, I guess. But but I think that, that Alias Grace is, uh, that Atwood's really interrogating, yeah, the binaries with which we, we look at women and women who are violent specifically. Yeah, I think those are two extremely important points to, to bring up. And I... Uh, I think they're 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 totally relevant and make sense. I really enjoy how the viewer mentioning right making the audience participate in this. I, I think that was a very interesting point, right? Because one of the major elements of historiographic metafiction as a concept, right, as a thing that people write deliberately, is to point attention or to to really emphasize the fact that history is a narrative. Right. This is something that we have decided to write down and that we have decided to frame in such a way. And this fits, I think, that well, this, this story, whether it's Atwood's version or her, even her first version, right? She wrote a, an initial version of Alias Grace known as The Servant Girl in 1974, or even Susanna Moody's version of that narrative, right, which she wrote in her own journals back in the 1830s, right? All of this comes up as an example that we, as observers, as readers, as people who can engage critically with history are all complicit in how this story is being told, right? Whether it's from, as Katie was mentioning, this binary of, you know, she's either mad or she's either a mad genius who is plotting everything or a poor damsel in distress who was just taken along for the ride. And I forget the name of her, uh, of the person who also was accused of the murder off the top of my head, but he was the, the the person behind it all along and she needed to be saved from this evil man right it's mm -hmm. it's very interesting i think to bring up both of these two concepts that you bring up together yeah absolutely yeah i think building on a point olivia sort of brought up i, w I wouldn't i would need to look up at the time if there was anything there but I, I, she she might be playing with our fascination with the crimes in the courtroom dramas of other people you know when we have these big cases that pop up and then everybody's watching it and everybody's like picking apart this case of say like a couple of years from, I think it was almost a decade ago, Casey Anthony and the death of Kaylee Anthony and everybody, the media was very focused and we were all very judgmental, even though it's not our story. And so I think that turning it back on us at the end is sort of Margaret Atwood going, why are you here? Why are you so obsessed with people being put on trial for these things for Judge Judy? Why is Judge Judy still, you know, such a big cultural phenomenon? Is it still on the air, actually? I'm unsure on that one. I wouldn't be surprised. I have no idea. But I don't watch TV. So, but yeah, I think that's definitely an interesting point, right? And I don't think, right, to come back to the initial question of why her, I don't think it's a coincidence that right around this time when the Grace Marks story is happening, this is the time when we saw the rise of the first penitentiaries in Canada, not eight years before before Grace Marks and... James McDermott. There James you go. James McDermott. <laughs> said the right name when I was muted, by the way. I'm sorry. So yeah, um, when, not, not a few years before Grace Marks and James McDermott were arrested and put on trial for this crime, there was the first penitentiary built in Kingston in Canada, right, in 1835. So we have this increasing fascination right around this time in society of containing madness, of containing this kind of so-called deviation from society, I guess. What, anything that doesn't fit into proper Anglo-Canadian society is immediately put away and examined. Right, We have this genuine fascination that I think you really hit the nail on the head with, Mackenzie, of how can we understand this, right? What are the many different angles that we can see this? And we can get into how those angles play out in the book if we want, because there's the doctor, there's a medium at some point that comes in. Uh, there's all kinds of things that, that happen that demonstrate the many ways in which we try, we being the people of the 19th century, try to make sense of this seemingly senseless act, 
and trying to force their assumptions into this case, right? These ingrained assumptions about women, about maybe immigrants, about class, about anything you want, right? Into something like crime. And I definitely think that fits all into this idea of, you know, fascination with, uh, with crime and criminality. I think anyway. that also just to interject, I think that um, Alias Grace was published in 96 mm. and Carla Homoka, I think, went to jail in about 95. So there is some over. And of course, like I think that the news coverage obviously started well before the trial. So oh, God, there's yeah. there's probably some, you know, overlap and certainly influence probably in the coverage of Carla Homoka that did impact Margaret Atwood's writing in this novel. Right. Absolutely. Do you I'm actually curious, like, do you think that changes your perception of the novel, right? If it's something that could be influenced by the modern day, right, but is trying to talk about the 19th century, does that change any of your idea of what the novel's trying to do? Or does it make it, in a sense, even more timeless, right? This idea of criticizing the way in which we perceive crime or we perceive people who are potentially uh, ill and who commit crimes and whatever, right? Who are subjected to these social judgments. Um, I don't know. Did you have any thoughts about that, maybe? Yeah, yeah I, personally. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mackenzie. I was just going to say, you know, I think part of what her point is that this is not a new phenomenon. This is something we've been doing for hundreds of years now, people. like this isn't new we've been doing this it's bad practice that it was a bad practice then it's a bad practice now yeah i was gonna say the same thing i was gonna actually push back on your comment that it was about that she was writing about the 19th century i think in a lot of ways she, you know that's just the setting of her story and that um you know the universal truths and and you know the themes that she's working with i think are are completely timeless unfortunately well, also is a comment on the fact that we really haven't moved forward in, I think, the way that we think about women and, as Katie said, like, binary ways. Right. I think absolutely. Atwood's always going to... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say absolutely. Go for it. I think Atwood's always going to want to talk about what Atwood wants to talk about at the time. Like, that's that's the kind of writer that she is. You know, she she's definitely going to use... Uh, time periods that she's interested to explore issues in modern society that she's interested, right? Like, interested in, sorry. Like, she does this all the time, you know? A or she even does the inverse. Like, she, with Gilead in The Handmaid's Tale, a lot of the things that she's talking about are, are historical. And she always says everything in The Handmaid's Tale has happened somewhere at some time. But she, she pulls from history to um, imagine a future dystopian uh American totalitarian society, but she also is extrapolating from us now and the problems that we have um, in our the problems that we have in um, what we do with people who commit crimes and, and and how we treat them now and to put that back in history, back in history. But it's you know I don't know. I always see Atwood just trying to talk about what Atwood wants to talk about in the moment, and I think that's true of Alias Grace. And I think she also fools us into believing that it's that she's not commenting on current society. Like I think mm. the way that mm. she sets up like Gilead, the way that she sets up this as being like something of the past or being something of the future, it does kind of like make us feel safe in some way. Like I think that that's, that was like kind of the interesting thing about when Handmaid's Tale on Hulu came out was that all of a sudden it was like, you know, this old story, but it felt new again and it felt really relevant in a bit of a scary way. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, exactly what she's trying to do, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But she would never admit. She no, would never admit. That's, she doesn't I, want to be the prophet. She doesn't want to be seen as a prophet, even oh though... Hilarious. I was yeah, just about to bring that up. That's one I of the tell reasons. stories. I don't... I'm not trying to say anything. Everybody else is saying something. I'm just telling stories. That's what frustrates me most about Margaret Atwood, right? I, you're a decent writer sometimes. No, okay, that's a hot take that you're decent. You're more than decent, at, especially your poetry. It's good. But <laughs> I, I don't buy into this at all, right? That it's just a book. I don't accept that as an excuse or as a justification. I think that she tries too hard, exactly as you are all pointing to, to make sure that you understand that this is not just a one-time thing, right? This is not just a story in a bottle. This has an impact, or this has a message concerning the past and the present and the future, whatever, right? And so to say 
it's just a novel to me is it diminishes not only her own work, but the work of literature as a whole, right? As a potential for something that can provide criticism uh, and can provide insight into our understanding of the world past and present. So that's one of my main <laughs> gripes against Atwood. Um, I guess that's more Atwood as a person and her perceptions on art, but it relates back to alias grace <laughs> in a way. Um, yeah, we were talking about that a bit before. That's why I was primed and ready to go with that comment. Sorry, but Atwood too, she's like, she also kind of um, contradicts herself because she says, I'm not the prophet of dystopia. All mm -hmm. this has happened. It's like, okay, yeah, but you're clearly, so you're clearly commenting. You're clearly yes. trying to make an impact. You're trying to do something beyond just make something beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, by admitting that you're not the prophet, that you're actually giving commentary, like, how can you say that, I don't know, how can, how can we actually, how could we really, with a straight face, say that these works aren't meant to move people and to, and like, to, to be move us warning. on social issues? Yeah, or be a warning. Handmaid's Tale is like a whole warning of where she, what she saw was happening to, in the American right and how much of it has started to come true in some ways. Um, it's like, I get that that's very overwhelming and spooky for her, mm -hmm. but I would love to just one day see her be like, yeah, I was right. <laughs> I am the prophet. Listen, <laughs> I have come down from the mountain and I will say unto thee. <laughs> um, look, having seen her give a, give a talk, I don't think she will ever, ever admit to that. Like she, the way she, she, she talks about her books, the way she talks about the world around her, she, she almost sees it as two completely different things. And I don't think she will ever admit to what you're saying, Katie. It's, <laughs> that's just a feeling that I get from listening to her speak and the way that I've, uh, from what I've looked into her as a, uh, as an academic and stuff like, like, that's just not something that I think she will ever do. Anyway, the point is the, um, it, it's interesting, right? Because even if we bring it back to alias grace, there's something to be said about, right? The way in which in a sense, this is, we were bringing it up earlier, this is trying to reinscribe certain voices into history, right? This, uh, right, Grace Marx barely, uh, barely had her own voice uh, at the time that she was on trial, right? Mostly it was the journals uh, who were, uh, who were telling the story. We got it through doctors. We got it through Susanna Moody. We barely got her own perception of it. So she's reinscribing this idea, right? She's opening up to the idea that history is more than what we say it is. But, right, one of my gripes with this book is that it kind of goes off what we were saying. It's not as if we've never heard an Irish immigrant story, right? Or it's not as if we've ever heard uh, a story of a crime, right? It's weird to me, right? We've never heard it quite in this way, but I feel it's almost a bit disingenuous to say that it's completely new and different, right? Maybe the format in which it's explained is new at the time, but I have a lot of difficulty reading this and saying, this completely changed my mind about Canadian history, right? And the way that we tell it. It didn't have as much of an impact as something, say, as The Handmaid's Tale or even the journals of Susanna Moody. There's something about it that seemed to reinforce certain elements that we choose to focus on in Canadian history. Uh, maybe that's just me. I just thought I'd bring it up <coughs> while, uh, while we were talking about this. Just to uh, be at the Patrick's point, I don't know if I ever, I don't know if I consider her trying to tell history, rather just trying to tell a story trying to raise a profile of an untold person more than anything else. I normally say, I, I do see this as it's as more biography and biopic than I do historical fiction. That's just sort of my, that was my personal take. When I was sort of looking over the story, how it was written, how it was structured, the focus on Grace Marks herself, on her story, unless the, the focus was not on the murder. It was not on the trial. It was not on what she had been going through. The focus was on who she was, why she was being treated this way, and what was going to happen to her and what was the other implications revolving around her so to me it always felt less like history and more like a biopic i, I missed obviously the first part of what you were just saying but like i said you were wrong essentially uh, okay great <laughs> I'm kidding awesome <laughs> <laughs> that's fine i love to be proven wrong but it's not the first time we've seen this but i do think it's interesting that she's 
I mean, I don't think we've seen it exactly in this way um, because she is, I think the fact that she is very young, that she's an immigrant, um, that she's, you know, working as a servant. Um, I don't know, like, I'm trying to think of, and I'm thinking of other Canadian, like, I'm thinking of Anne of Green Gables. Like, she, I mean, she isn't probably as, like, in terms of the class element, is is, is approached very differently in this story. I think that's mm-hmm. probably because it's a woman and, and female crime. I think that it's easy to overlook, um, like, the, the, the theme of class and, and how Margaret plays with that in this in a really interesting way. Um, that I maybe it's with. not revolutionary, but I, I don't think it's... It doesn't. It didn't feel like something I'd seen so many times before, because we also don't really see. I mean, true crime through the through the lens of a woman's voice is also. Let me try that again. Um, true crime from a woman's perspective is very unusual. I mean, we're seeing more and more of it, but it's from a woman's perspective when the woman is potentially the assailant. Do we have that? I don't know if we have that. I don't I know if I've seen that. Honestly, cannot comment on. That. <laughs> like it didn't. I'll agree with you at least in the point that the class element, right? This might be my Marxism showing through. I'm sorry, but like <laughs> this might be the, like the class element I thought was really interesting, and the way that it combines like class, immigration, womanhood, all that kind of stuff into one interesting narrative. That I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I think that I've rarely seen something like that. Olivia, I'm sorry, you. I have to I have to agree with Katie okay. on this one. I don't think it's I don't think it's a super tired narrative and I also kind of want to push back a little bit on the idea that like it's that she's try that I I don't actually I don't want to misinterpret what you're saying, but my understanding of what you said was that she was like kind of trying to um give a retelling of history in some way or be like historical and I I don't feel like that at all. I mean like she's mm-hmm. taking historical truths um mm-hmm. but then taking you know extreme liberties with them and telling like a very like fictional story you know like she is calling attention obviously to a certain time in history but i don't think she's really interested in i uh, obviously she's interested in getting certain things right and and having some you know she does her research you know she's known she's known for being you know as like you know meticulous with her research but mm-hmm. i don't think ultimately her goal here is to represent history i think i think she's more interested in being you know a a fiction writer or you know like a a novelist here that's my interpretation but you know i'm not in her head jordan i I really do agree with olivia on that one the creation of the doctor character in its entirety is a totally fictitious element and we know she re looked over the story and what she was writing after checking out what Susanna mooney had written because she knew Susanna mooney had gotten a lot of it false yep but there seems to be a lot more of a, if she was writing historical retelling, we would have had a more, a stronger focus on the dates of the actual crime in the court itself. And from what I've seen and what I've understood of the plot with only seeing the one episode of the TV series and reading a plot summary online, a very detailed one, but still only a summary. Yep. That's not where we're looking. We're looking at Grace Marks. From what I've understood, right. And the, the reason why I'm bringing it up. So I'm I'm happy to be proven wrong in this case, right? <laughs> like you, you all, all three of you bring up a really interesting point. But the what what makes me uh, think that there is still a strong historical element into this was the talk that I mentioned earlier that she gave a couple of years after the publication, where she basically refers to as her role as a writer, right, is to take the history, right, that which was already established, and offer a perspective on what's missing in that history right it's that that that's where the historiographic metafiction comes in right is like okay but i gotta jump in here Pat. go for it go for it please she's taking history Mm -hmm. and she's filling in the gaps you know based on the history she's making up the history you know (laughs) but it's still based on the facts that she's read it's still based on the ideas that she has of the time and based on the research that she's doing of the Listen, time right i hear you and i am on board with her excellent research skills mm-hmm. but by virtue of the fact that she is just making things up where she does not know like i think transports it like completely out of the yeah. so the history genre for and me, also incorporating for the weird supernatural element at the end where grace marks gets possessed by well, possessed, I say in air quotes, because it's also sort of taken to help prove the point of split personality disorder. Like, there seems to be a lot more going on than just representing the facts. 
So, okay, I'm fine. I, I'll probably, I'm probably wrong on this. Let me ask you this then. A lot of history, right, especially in like nine, around the time that she's referring to, right, was, as you say, uh, as Mackenzie pointed out, flat out created, right? And we considered that history for a long time, right? Why is Margaret Atwood's version of doing that fiction? Is it because she intended it as such, right? In, your, uh, in the way that you're conceiving of it is because it's intended as fiction that it is fiction? Or is it because the others were labeled as history in a wrong way, or were wrongly labeled as history, right? When they did it, when they created stuff out of nowhere and claimed it was history, right? So that's, that's just me thinking about the meaning of history, right? And history writing. But I don't know, the, the, there's a solid argument, I think, that a lot of people have, been make, uh, have made throughout, uh, uh, throughout you know, the past couple of decades, right? Hayden White is a really important scholar in that field of narr narrativizing history, right? But the idea of inventing stuff for the sake of a history is nothing new, right? So is it intent that's, that matters here? Um, as far as Elia's Grace is concerned? In part. I okay. mean, Atwood would say she's writing fiction. Atwood does say she's writing fiction. She says it all the time. Yep. <laughs> I, I, do, I do take your point, though, that she uses a lot. She's definitely using it as an opportunity to explore um, the, the madness in Victorian era, which was a society obsessed with the concept of madness. Mm -hmm. um, she's using it to explore the idea of the penitentiary, um, and she's using it to explore the class element and that's going on of, it's going on at that time. Like, and those from at least, you know, my knowledge of that time in history, although I'm, I'm not a history major, mm -hmm. um, is like, there's accuracy to that. But I still think, you know, it's color to the story that's mostly made up. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I, uh, I'll just move on to something else instead of putting my foot in my mouth once again. Um, but it's so much fun beating you into a pulp. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yes, it is kind of fun. It's fine. But like, seriously, that, that, again, that's probably just me thinking about it too hard because a lot of what I do is based on the combination of history and literature. Like I think about this all the time. But the, the, I think you bring up some very interesting points in regards to this uh, text. But Katie, you brought up something interesting, right? Of, okay, well, she, she refers to, you know, class. She refers to madness that the Victorians were obsessed with and penitentiaries, etc. Did any of you find yourself, you know, uh, thinking about the actual history of it, right? So we've been talking about the historical elements of it, but is this something that you find offers a good look as to, or at least even if you don't know if it's accurate or not, but you find that it offered a convincing look as to what things were like at the time, right, for Grace Marx. Uh, whether, for example, in the penitentiary and the way that the people were living through that, right? Is this something that, you know, uses history in an effective way, in a sense, that makes it seem believable that this kind of thing would happen? that they would go through some really arduous days uh, or that they would be, you know, uh, whipped or branded and stuff like that. Just, um, you know, is, this, is this fictional story something that holds at least a grain of historical truth to it in a sense, right? In the way it's written. Well, I think so. I think it calls attention to a lot of really important things that I think sometimes we forget about. Um, you know, I think like, you know, the uh, abortion subplot, I think is really interesting and deserves mm -hmm. some attention. I think even to the extent that um, her friend is like a rebel <laughs> with the Mackenzie King situation, I think yeah. is, is, is really interesting and I think often forgotten about too. And, and so I think that there, there certainly is, uh, and, and I think even like psychology or psychiatry generally, I think is, is kind of like an interesting um, theme or, or something, something to think about. So I definitely think that there are elements that she, she's drawing our attention to and reminding us, um, you know, of a lot of things. I've just touched on like a million things, but, you know, mm -hmm. I think those are all, all things that we should, you know, keep in mind. Yeah. Um, I, I can go on, but to, I, I feel like I've rambled a lot. Uh, Katie or Mac, did you have anything to add about that or about the style and its relation to history? Yeah, that or what Olivia was saying. Um, 
Yeah, I think they're again, she's such a detailed, meticulous writer. Obviously, the history is important to her, but she made a very conscious choice on what themes she wanted to play up with that history. Yeah. And the themes weren't about history, historical recognition. It was more, again, the abortion subplot. There's a discussion of the penitentiary system, asylums, how we treat madness and mental health, which is an ongoing discussion that's still very important to talk about today. All of these, I feel, are very important to talk about today. Oh, yeah. Like, let's face yeah, it, it's just mental abortion health is on the forefront of my mind because of yep. the COVID situation. It's something that's been affecting a lot of people and getting a lot more mm-hmm. coverage now. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm actually curious, right? Because abortion is not something that we've talked, I think, at all, right, uh, on on nope. the show ever. I. Not my place, man. <laughs> exactly. Look, we're going to use the fact that we have women on the show for like to our full advantage here, right? What um, what did you find particularly interesting uh, about that subplot, Olivia? You you that was like one of the first examples you brought up. What was it that was so interesting to you about it? I'm so glad to speak on behalf of all women. <laughs> no, I'm sorry for shoving you into that. It's just we, we have two on the show. Hey, I'm just like, kidding. That's, that's represent. I'm just kidding. I'm just yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just kidding. Um. <laughs> I, well, I think it's important because, uh, you know, I think that sometimes we forget and it gets certainly lost in our society mm-hmm. today, um, you know, just how dangerous child, childbirth actually is and, and kind of the huge, well, especially it was a burden at that time that women bore, you know, um, you know, even under the best of circumstances, you know, saying that you're, you know, maybe a wealthy woman who's married, who's in a very stable situation, you know, childbirth is still extremely dangerous. So, you know, when you're someone who's lower class, who's having a relationship um, out of wedlock, that's, you know, scandalous and could potentially ruin your reputation, you know, maybe having an uh, abortion is your only option. And the they were extremely extremely dangerous to do at the time and you know often resulted in death so it's yeah it's 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 a super important thing to draw attention to because i think that it's something that we as a society you know need to continue to not take for granted because you know things like birth control (laughs) not to get too like crazy for this podcast but like have really transformed society and and have really kind of changed the way that women can can partake in society and and be um you know on more equal footing so yeah katie (laughs) i think it's interesting that she has this abortion subplot because i don't even know if she knows how historically relevant that is because um during this time and i don't know about in in canada but certainly in victoria england there was um uh i took history of criminal justice in undergrad so i do remember this fact but there Mm -hmm. was like an an, an overwhelming explosion of uh, abortions uh, during this time because there was also corresponding to um, extreme sexual oppression. There was also like an explosion of uh, out of wedlock sex, um, which is not just like a Foucaultian theory. That's like there's like data like that that happened. Yep. Um, so having an abortion subplot actually is like super culturally relevant um, from my understanding. Sorry, uh, historically relevant from from my understanding. Um, but in addition to, so I thought that was interesting she included it, it's very Atwood, but I think in addition to that, the way that um, she talks about motherhood uh, in general in the story is is interesting. Of course, you know, like Grace's relationship with her mother is a bit kind of strange, um, very sad, mostly just really sad, but she also, the like the, the kind of the way she so casually talks about, well, like, then you have another one and maybe it kills you and maybe you die in childbirth and then you go on. Like, the way she she's so nonchalant about, um, you know, how, like, how traumatic childbirth is on, on a woman's body is, uh, I think, pretty poignant. And, you know, we don't really have, I don't know if anybody in the story dies in childbirth, but she, she kind of hits all those all those notes Atwood does um, for a good, re- well-rounded feminist historical yeah. fiction <laughs> the, Like that, this idea that you bring up of like, oh, well, you try again and, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. You just kind of move on. I just kind of bring it back to the idea of class that you were bringing up. I don't think, th- I think that I kind of idea, and I could be wrong historically of this, like, again, I'm not a specialist in abortion history or even history of sexuality in any way, shape, or form, but it kind of fits in within this idea of you can't really afford to have that much of an emotional attachment to a lot of these things. Not only 
as a woman are, from what I've understood, like the emotions were very much controlled by dominant society at the time, but also as someone of lesser means, right? A poor immigrant, you're, you're kind of put in this position where you have to brush off a lot of things and kind of take a, uh, have like a stiff upper lip and keep going. And in this case, well, uh, either work or keep on with your sentence, right? So I think there's definitely a, a, a lot at play here at the same time that's wildly interesting. Something else that was brought up that I thought was really interesting, I think it was, it, it might have been you, Mackenzie, that, uh, that, that mentioned it, was when Grace was possessed. And the idea that kind of parallels the treatment that Dr. Jordan gives at the same time. So you have at the same time this highly scientific medical uh, person who's, well, for the time, right? <laughs> uh, it's highly scientific. We, ha we have issues maybe with his methods today, but that contrasts, right, this more supernatural aspect of it. And to come back to this idea of, you know, how does she use history? I think this is a very interesting way that she does at least use it, is this kind of shift that we see in the 19th century from, or at least more concretely, this shift from the mythical and the supernatural to the scientific, right? Much more concretely in society. And a desire to perceive crime in a very scientific and methodological way, right? To conceive everything, right, in that kind of way. So you see the old mentality kind of dying away, right? This uh, possession scene is one person, people aren't really buying it. It's more of a it's more of a party trick than anything else, right? The way it's written about is more of a, a kook thing. But the scientific aspect of it, the doctor, uh, Dr. Jordan, right? People trust in him, right? People expect him to deliver results. And his outlook on the situation is very much the one that I feel, at least when reading it, predominates, uh, at least for most people, right? About Grace Marks, uh, outside of Grace herself. Yeah, just sort of building off because what we're looking at there is the cross section of the the sort of again quote unquote supernatural element and the sort of scientific practice yeah. which makes sense because she's writing in the style of a victorian novel and that was a very important feature of those sorts of novels where they sort of had this because we people were very much trying to figure these things out at the time so there was a lot of overlap in the systems you know you had great literary scientific scholarly minds who are also part of occult clubs because it's what they thought was interesting and what they thought was important to study famously charles dickens was part of a ghost club oh yeah and, yeah. and it's just so and i think she uses it to great effect to mm -hmm. build up this weird cult-like obsession for grace marks you know she was again i don't want to be very crude with it but she was a maid she was a small 16 year old maid why is she having these people writing letters to have her set free there was this weird, like, people began this following for her. And I think I would plays off of that in a major way. Oh, honestly, I didn't think of that. That's very interesting. I didn't think of the... I thought of that while you were talking. <laughs> so, I, I didn't, I think didn't even think of it. <laughs> right, of the, the, the kind of cult element that she gained. Right, because it literally gained her freedom at the end, right? She Because she didn't serve a life sentence. Uh, she officially got a life sentence, but she was set free after, I think, 30 years in total. Mm -hmm. right? We don't know about the, the end of her life. She, she went to the United States, and after that, it's literally a ghost. That's a very interesting point. I don't have anything to say about it at the moment because I wasn't expecting it, but I love that. Grace Marks as herself kind of takes on this supernatural element, not only in the time as a cult figure, but her ghost kind of remains in a sense, in our common imagination, right? When we're imagining, when we're talking about her 60 years later when Al Alias Grace was published and now today, 20 years after that, right? The ghost of Grace Marx still kind of permeates into our discussions about class, madness, women in history and prisons, right? I really think that's an interesting point. I don't know if this is exactly on point, but I do think that um, interspersing the supernatural with the scientific is... Uh, fascinating because i think atwood would probably say that they're they both have similar aims it's all it's the it's the high-minded idealistic pursuit of truth and where we once uh tried to explain things well some some people still do it and not taking away from that explain things as god now we try to explain it with science and um i always think that that's that's interesting uh like as a device but yeah I don't know. I still have this bit of a complex where the supernatural kind of, it, it's, it, it loses me a little bit. 
much. <laughs> um, I need to work on that. I need to be more open, but it sometimes I'm kind of like, okay, <laughs> but that's like no, but my own problem. I think it's interesting because actually in the series, I felt during that scene that they played it like she was actually in control that Grace Marks was manipulating the situation and that she wasn't actually, like, possessed, but rather she was, like, taking, yeah, like, she was she was playing with them because she knew that she was kind of this quasi-celebrity. This um, cult personality. Yeah. And so I think it's funny because I think that, like, if you watch that scene, you would actually find it was, like, the perfect modern interpretation of it because it doesn't, like pull you out of the story it actually like pulls you in in some way ways and and really adds a lot to her character yeah that's something that i think comes through a bit in the novel as well i i haven't gotten to that part in the series yet but remembering the novel i feel like that's something that atwood kind of plays with a bit this idea of it's not quite sure if she's actually possessed or not it can be a bit subject to debate the way that she describes grace's actions in that moment it leaves it a bit open as to whether she she is in control right you you definitely get that in the novel as well yeah see yeah. i didn't think she was possessed okay in the novel. interesting go for it oh no i, I don't oh, i don't think she was possessed at all i think she was probably probably playing up the situation a bit or there was a very severe case of mental health issue going on my point earlier was just at what it was sort of bringing in this sort of occult fascination that would have been had at the time and again, that's something, maybe it's just a case showing off how brilliant Grace Marks was in her manipulation, playing off what she knew people would like to see. Maybe we can. this can be kind of one last question, uh, because we've already been talking for a bit over an hour at this point. Maybe this can be one last question about the novel yeah. before we conclude. But th this kind of leads into the idea, I wrote down this question of sensationalism and realism, right? That's played with, with the novel, right? And I feel like this is one of the ways in which this novel transcends the time in which it's set, right? Or the, the story in general transcends the time in which it's set, is this idea of the impact of sensationalizing a case like this, right? Making it bigger than it actually is. So on a microcosmic level, you definitely get this with the medium, right? That, that, that whole scene. Okay, it's giving this supernatural allure to this case, right? that conflicts with the reality that we all expect, right? That whether or not she, she, she was faking it or not, or whether or not she was crazy or sane or whatever. But you can also see it on a larger level, right? With the way in which the media definitely got on the bandwagon at the time, right? Of this whole case, people were on it so very fast, right? And in an intense level, right? Historically speaking, Grace Marks was the topic of so many newspaper articles at the time. And a lot of them were uh, exaggerating or salacious and definitely jumped on the bandwagon of, was there a bit of sexual impropriety going on in the Thomas Kinnear household? And it may not be the same kind of sensationalism that we might imagine with uh, in a supernatural sense, but I think this whole idea is definitely relevant in thinking about you know how we perceive a case like this right, as something that maybe more than it actually seems, right? It's kind of more than meets the eye. I almost got to think the sensationalism is reality. It is the realism. We, we do sensationalize. It's always, it, it's always fun, nice to say, oh, it's just a TV show. They over-exaggerate these things. But we have real cases. Again, with the Carla Hermako case that we've been bringing up. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I apologize if I it's didn't. It's incredible how much you butcher names. God damn, dude. I'm really bad at them. I'm very sorry. What Carla Hamalka. Sorry? Hamalka. I'm not even going to try it's again. L, just, but whatever. Yes, okay. go on. We do sensationalize these things. There's not a lot of non-reality in that part of the story. Yeah, I think that Grace Marks is kind of critical of the sensationalism. She's always like, all these people are writing letters. Like, wow. And um, she's like, well, that's not how it happened. This is how it happened. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, what is more sensational than taking this murder and using it like for from Abwood's perspective and using it as a way to tell like a hundred different stories about sex, being a new Canadian class, 
women and violence. Like, it's <laughs> like Margaret Atwood is taking this one crime from this mm -hmm. young, by this young woman and blowing it up a million times its size. I think the, I think the, in, almost the genre of true crime is <laughs> sensational. Like, right. I, I don't really see how you avoid it. Yeah, I don't listen to many true crime podcasts, but from what I've Nor heard, me. It's, for, yeah, this, it's, for that exact reason. Yeah, it seems like it's an insane hodgepodge of just sensationalism and playing off of the pain that a lot of people went through. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think in some ways I want to believe that Margaret Atwood is calling attention to it by choosing someone we know or we find out is a very unreliable narrator. Um, and I think that she calls into question that, um, you know, what's really real here? We don't know. And we never really know because we don't have a good narrator. And what's the point of it? It's that we enjoy talking about it. We enjoy exploring the um, extreme and antisocial human behavior because it's strange. It's not that we're actually looking for truth or what actually happened on that evening. It's it's about just our own imaginations of like the depths and the heights of you know, what human behavior can look like. I guess as a way to conclude, right? Uh, because uh, unless you had like a really salient point that you wanted to talk about, but it's already like almost 9.30 here when we're recording, so we're going to try to wrap this up a bit. Was there anything in particular that you wanted to address about the book that you're like, okay, this really needs to be talked about that we haven't really touched upon, right? Maybe a, a contemporary relevance to the book that you want to uh, address, right? Uh, we didn't necessarily talk about the way in which uh, it reflects upon uh, our memory of certain things and how history can be called into question. Like we didn't really touch into that. Is there anything that, or maybe, you know, your own experiences as lawyers with this type of sensationalism, if it happened, right? Is this something that speaks to you in any way, shape or form? I don't know, but uh, is this, uh, what are your I guess final thoughts on it that you want to bring up? Well, not to continue shamelessly plugging our show, yes, but totally. in terms of um, the the memory point, I, I do think it's interesting, and we did talk about this actually in our episode about the Giancomeschi trial, um, how that was like, that was kind of like center at the trial of like what actually happened, and there was some mistakes in memory, and you know, how trauma changes your memory, or um or those kind of things. So we do have a whole conversation about that in our episode on Gian Gomeshi. Yeah, just to, to piggyback on that, Liv, it's definitely, I think that the story of Grace Marks, you definitely could look at at least parts of it in the way she tells it as, yeah, the fail the failing of human memory, the, the failure of uh, the human eye witness and the, the complete unreliability of it. And I think that certainly Gian Gomeshi is a good test case for that. Um, in terms of like final thoughts on the novel, um, I recommend it. <laughs> I I enjoyed it. I like zoo. I listened to it as fast as I could to to cram for this show. But I would recommend that you you really do kind of sink your teeth into it and spend your time with it because I do think it's definitely worthwhile. It's um, you know like for an Atwood, I think it's a good Atwood. And also this and also the CBC uh series on netflix it's really good it has some really big canadian actors in it that's right yeah oh no honestly uh i i, I know i've maybe like i said i put my foot in my mouth and maybe some parts of, <laughs> with, with, with margaret atwood that but i i do think that this novel is definitely worth looking into like i said m many of my problems with her is her writing style more than anything mm -hmm. else but the ideas that she brings up patrick she's not coming on your show i know Gotta work so harder. there you go yeah, we're not big <laughs> enough yet but yes. first before we get margaret atwood we have to try hard for celine dion that's who that's oh what patrick God. really wants oh i would kill to have celine dion on the show oh I would You're a big so My Heart Will Go On fan? No, I hate Celine Dion with a passion. <laughs> <laughs> I was missing the joke there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, there's it's no way you could have series that nobody else listens to. Because we, we have a separate show where we talk about, to plug our own show, just to piggyback, of, piggyback your plugging with our plugging. Yep. We do a side series called Pop Canada. I sort of run it and every month we talk about like a specific faucet person, industry of pop culture in Canada. We sort of do a deep dive. And sort of present it mm -hmm. cool. and yeah celine dion comes up every once in a while patrick but, really doesn't like her for some reason I, 
anyway, we're not going to get into. We it have here. a whole bit on our Celine Dion episode about people who love to hate Celine Dion. That's me. There you <laughs> and go. what it says about them. <laughs> yep. I totally accept myself as a trash person. It's fine. <laughs> the, no, that's not the take. But 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 have a listen. If you're I curious. I will. It's on my it's on my listening list. I'm slowly making my way through your episodes. But the um, the point I wanted to make right is, Katie, you're absolutely right. It right. Did, no matter what your opinions are of Atwood as a person, as a writer, as a I think this book definitely at least has something for everyone in terms of themes, in terms of its approach. There's definitely something that is bound to please anyone and is definitely worth a discussion, if nothing else. Did anybody else think that all the male characters were bad pretty well? Yeah. Like, yeah. there wasn't a good male character. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, it's true, good except in I what did sense. like the doctor. I did like the doctor. But he's he's very complicated, too. Like No, he's super complicated. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I love, I love that... It's yeah, but she no, always no, has female villains the, as well. But there's the one guy um, who's the year younger than him. Her, Mr. Like, Walsh. Yeah, like he's sweet. Yeah, he's I sweet, guess. but he's like okay, fine, whatever. I, <laughs> to be honest, okay, again, I have no proof to back this up, right? But and I, I feel like part of that comes from her way of writing that is still kind of steeped in this second wave feminism that had this kind of outlook on male and female characters, right? I'm generalizing massively on a lot of things, right? But from what I've read of that time period and what I've what I know of her feelings and her opinions about certain things, I I want to say that's kind of where that comes from. But I have nothing to back this up with. Anyway, Mac, did you have anything to add? <laughs> well thank you for coming on. Honestly, that's go. the biggest thing. That's the only thing I really have to add is the, another thank you. Yeah, go absolutely. go go give them a listen, you guys. Go give Katie, Katie and Liv a listen. That's very nice. <laughs> absolutely. Well, why don't you tell us a bit more about your show or maybe other projects that you're working on? Yeah. yeah. Or if we need to contact you for legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, our podcast, Just Watch Me, you can find us at uh, Just Watch Me Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Send us an email at the just watch me podcast at gmail.com. And um, if you have any ideas for stuff you want to talk about, send them to us because we love, we love ideas. But that's mostly our, that this is our hobby. I mean, being mm -hmm. lawyers is actually our full-time job and in podcasting is our, our hobby. So we're, we're pretty booked. That, that pretty much takes up all of our time. I've, I've yeah. got to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you like how do you uh, i'm actually curious but like how do you approach that as a hobby do you because you get like, as we mentioned right you got the leader of the green party on it right uh, on your show and so oh, damn yeah like that's who we were talking about before i mean Anthony paul but the, is the leader of the green party but the you know for a hobby that's incredible <laughs> like we it's a hobby for us too and we don't put half as much effort into it um like how do you what, what do you decide to, 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 like, what kind of effort do you decide to put in in the show or things like that? Or do you just basically go on a whim based of what you feel like? Well, Olivia is the booker, so she gets all credit for the guests that we've been able to get. So I have nothing to do with that. But, mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know what, well, she can talk about her strategy in booking people, but uh, we, we, so she's an entertainment lawyer, so we are definitely, and we both are like making conscious efforts to watch more Canadian TV. So Canadian entertainment is another big theme of the show, of course. So that's mm -hmm. why we have, we've had quite a few actors on, um, and that kind of thing. So that's always, that's always part of it. Um, I'm a little bit more into politics. So that's why, um, although Olivia, Olivia did get an enemy, Paul, make no mistake, but that's, that's why we kind Excuse of- Excuse me, I'm also there. very into politics. Yes, you are, you are, but you're more- Make it sound like I'm like, oh I God. only want to have actors. No, come on. <laughs> I mean, nothing wrong with that, but still. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do we approach it in terms of like work-life balance, if that's mm -hmm. the question? Yeah, um, sure. We don't, we just work all the time. You just, just kind of wing it, There's, yep. Yeah, we don't have, we don't believe in work-life balance. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm um and it balance um, it's is a myth. myth it's not yeah, real it's a myth. okay yeah but i mean to be honest like a lot of it's uh, from from my perspective anyway i mean we have we have like a very divide and conquer mentality um there's obviously two of us and we take advantage of the fact that there's two of us but i think like to to be honest like i just i bulk i bulk work like i'll do 
like probably like five hours of work of worth of work on the podcast one day and then not work on it for a week or you know what I mean? Like it's like, totally, I, I usually totally understand. It. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I do. Most of the notes that you saw were made yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, honestly, as Mackenzie said, thank you very much for being on the show and we'd love to have you back anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. This was so much fun. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to hear it. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time on Wait, Historic. We, what? You didn't plug us, Patrick. You have to plug us. How do people support us? <sighs> They can support us on Patreon for $3 a month. You can get access to Mackenzie's extra episode of Pop Canada every single month. You can also check out our recommended reading page. Anything you want, really. Hey, leave a review. Leave a review on Just Watch Me as well. Leave a review everywhere. It helps the shows that you listen to in really important ways, right? It gets it to more people's ears. And generally, it just feels nice to get reviews, especially if, if they're, they're angry. Five star. Let us know. Like, if we make mistakes, let us know. We want to yep. learn, get better, Absolutely. stop being ignorant. If you're the biggest Margaret Atwood stan, reach out to us and tell us why we were wrong. If you're Margaret Atwood, reach out to us and tell us why we were wrong. <laughs> Whatever it is, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And yeah, we'll see you all next time on Historia Canadiana. Cheers, everyone.